Coming up next on Boston Rock Talk, Kevin Devine. We talk with the Brooklyn-based singer-songwriter about making music from folk to rock and writing lyrics about things that matter. Welcome to Boston Rock Talk, a live music and interview show we do here in Boston. Today we're here in Cambridge at the Sinclair, and our guest is Kevin Devine joining me here. Kevin? Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Hey, good to have you here. You're dressed for the weather? Appropriately, yeah. I'm dressed for the weather. You suffered through a, a marvelous calf ride to get here. Yeah, well, uh, I got to uh, spend about an hour more on Boston College's campus than I intended to. Are you going to go? Or, you know, you graduated, <laughs> you went to college, I didn't did. you? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to ever do uh, postgraduate work, but now I feel like well, I've got a, a deeper understanding of their campus if I ever want to do. Well, let's see how the music career pans out. Yeah, then, it's, it's definitely up in the air. Well, you were a journalism major, were you? I not? was, yeah. There's no future in that. You don't want to, you don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> My brother is actually a, a sports writer for Yahoo. Oh, really? Uh -oh. And uh, he's, he's, he's carried the journalism flag uh, for the family there. more ably than I would have. So You carry the music flag for I'm the family. trying to. You started doing this professionally, what, 2002, maybe? I, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I've been someone's handed me money to play music since like 1994 <laughs> yeah. but i always had other <laughs> other jobs and and uh was a student and working and but uh I, I this has been my only uh profession since 2005. which so. it's a good thing to be able to say that yeah that's, i that's, feel that's... i feel like that if it's it's definitely you know it's been scratching and clawing and you can kind of like i feel like i've i've been able to make it my own thing. So now you have collaborated with a number of people mm -hmm. uh, over the years. You want to list off some of your various? Uh... Sure. I mean, I think that the the people I'm most immediately identified with. There's a band called Brand New mm -hmm. from Long Island. Uh, there's a singer for that band's a guy named Jesse Lacey. There's a band called Manchester Orchestra from Atlanta. Yep. The singer from that band's called Andy Hull. Mm -hmm. We actually play, we have a band together, Andy and I, called Bad Books, and we played here at the Sinclair in, I want to say, February of 2013. Mm -hmm. um, but those two bands, Brand New in Manchester and, and, and myself, we, I feel like we've kind of, America, Australia, Canada, England, Europe, I mean, we've kind of gone all over the place together. Some variant of those three bands is always seems to be doing something together. You so. have a, a goddamn band, too. Yeah, that's, that's my, like, sort of collect backing collective sort of any any time mm -hmm. I'm performing on a stage not alone under the name <laughs> Kevin Devine yeah it's with the goddamn band <laughs> and there's been probably 20 people in the goddamn band over the course of 12 years so are they proud to be goddamn band I think members some then? probably more proud than others <laughs> I, I, I always kind of felt bad saddling them with that name I, I, I it was sort of a joke mm. uh, that came out of like I was listening to a lot of country music mm -hmm. and I come from punk music a little too and I mm -hmm. thought oh it's kind of funny to have it be like this guy and his goddamn band right and um funny or not it's stuck for for 12 years and, and so now that's it's, it's your label that's the thing I, yeah. I had a friend who was in a country rock band called the goddamn Nixons wow good name huh? yeah, that's actually, a, yeah. yeah. They, that sounds more punk rock than country he's kind of retired maybe you could borrow it i'll yeah. talk to him give him a call that. i um, can't pay him anything but let him know no, 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 yeah no. <laughs> the, uh, one thing i want to ask about is i mean given the, the collaborative nature of what you do and now today you're doing this is i think the second date of a solo tour third date of a, third solo, date of a tour, solo tour yeah um what makes you want to do one versus the other well, sometimes it's as, as sort of simple and unsexy as circumstance. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. like this was a tour it's with Evan Weiss from a band called Into It Over It that's his project and mm -hmm. Laura Stevenson. The three of us do this and also the three of us sometimes play more dressed up with kind of rock treatments mm -hmm. of our songs. Mm -hmm. But we, for this, it was as simple as we wanted to present the songs this way and wanted mm -hmm. to have a sort of simple, tight, you know, a show that travels easy. Mm -hmm. um, and but, but for me, from, from a writing perspective, there's stuff that, I love things like Nirvana and the Pixies and um, R.E.M. And, and, and bands that could do both. <laughs> bands that were kind of had gentle moments, but also frenetic, noisy. 
And I grew up with Dylan, and Dylan obviously had both. Neil Young had both. Uh, and, 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 you know, Elliot Smith was a big performer for me. And mm -hmm. he, he was so good at the gentle thing, but also had this really wonderful ear for arrangement. So I kind of, I, I feel like I write them this way, but when I'm writing them, I can hear, oh, this one's going to have drums, and this one's going to have a distorted guitar, and this mm -hmm. one's going to, some records, like this one will have a violin, or this one will have glockenspiel and piano. But the challenge to me is always to make it as compelling this way as it is, whether there's 10 people on stage with me or, or well, That's alone. sort of, I think, the standard most songwriters have. It's got to work acoustically first. Yeah, I think so. And then the ornamentation can come and, yeah. and all of that. And hopefully it can kind of be as compelling in two different directions. And some songs you get there and some songs you don't. But. Right. Well, you, and you release different versions of the same song, right? Yeah. You done, I mean, what are some of the ones you've done? Well, we did a song called She Can See Me for these last two records, mm -hmm. uh, Bubblegum and Bulldozer. And, and we, when I wrote it, I thought I kind of, there's a band from Scotland called the Vaselines. I love the Vaselines. And I thought yes. it sort of sounded to me like um, the Vaselines, if you split it, if you go soft with them, they kind of sound like Bell and Sebastian. And if you go <laughs> hard with them, they sound like Nirvana. Right, right. Or Nirvana, you could hear it in there. Yeah. And uh, so I, this one song I wrote, and it sort of sounded to me like it could be, it could be both. Mm -hmm. So my, I said, well, we're doing a soft record and a hard record. We'll put the Bell and Sebastian one on here and the Nirvana one on there. And you're going to do one of that song later yeah, today, right? Yeah. Of course, right. But mm -hmm. it ended up kind of moving around and became more like a, uh, the soft one became more like Teenage Fan Club or Not A Surf or something, power pop. Mm -hmm. And the loud one still sounds like. Nirvana one. But, yeah. <laughs> You're very free with dropping uh, influences and names, which I like. Uh, I've, I've dealt with musicians sometimes who almost will deny any sort of influence whatsoever. Which is impossible. Yeah. It's just that, that, that you're being a little too precious when you do that. The yeah. whole, everyone is, 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 you know, cooking with the same ingredients mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I think you're just trying to... I remember having an argument with a friend about Elliot Smith, who was a really formative songwriter for me, and my friend said, he's not that great, he just makes stuff that's been around a long time sound like his own. <laughs> and I was like, so in other words, he's doing the hardest <laughs> thing there is to do in the world, and he does it effortlessly. Yeah. So, but I mean, I, I feel like that's, we all have these influences, you're just trying to kind of, you're not reinventing the wheel, you're just trying to like put your own spin your on own it. Your own spin on so. it, of course, right, exactly. Um, you're gonna start us off with Now Navigate? Yeah, like that's right. right. Um, and before we even start that, I was I was looking at the lyrics the other night, and uh, there's something there's something very REM-ish about it. This, uh, you're talking about, actually. Let me just look yeah, for the line. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, your line: I can't answer anything honestly without an asterisk. Air quotes and double speak litter the fountain of youth, which reminded me of REM's. Freak, where's the frequency, Kenneth? Oh what's yeah, the frequency? what's the frequency, Kenneth from Monster? Can, yeah. can you just tell me a little bit about that? I mean, that's a great line. Your your couplet there. Tell me a bit about that. How that fits in the song and how well, true that is. <laughs> I mean, I, I, f I feel like that a lot of my songs thematically are about. It's complicated being a person. It's complicated being uh, uh, consistent, and, and it's also it's complicated um, making sense of, of, I feel like the world kind of throws a lot of contradictory impulse at you and trying to kind of like figure out, navigate a path yeah. through that is uh, disorienting. And I think that most of the people, everyone I know has some aspect of struggling with this kind of stuff, but I think the people I know who are the sanest are the people that make peace with allowing the contradictions to, to live in their head. Mm -hmm. Instead of, I can't mm -hmm. see anything black and white anymore. Right. Things just aren't that way. My experience is not that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So I can't ask, answer anything honestly without an asterisk. It's kind of like, it's a little winky maybe, but it's also kind of like a bit tragic to me because there's always a bit of a, there's a qualifier with right. everything. Yeah. And, um, but if I'm peaceful with that, then it's, then it's okay. But if I try to tell myself that's bad or wrong or other people know how to do it better than me or something, that's a kind of, uh, you're kind of sentencing yourself to a difficult path through, through your life that way. And air quotes and double speak litter the fountain of youth. Um, maybe a lot of the dodges and feints and ways you try to figure out your way around it kind of end up, uh, you know, it makes things a little bit less pure mm -hmm. or it makes going back to the source a little harder mm -hmm. or uh, pressing reset. And we're all looking for that sort of magical cure sometimes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't involve having to do the work, but maybe you have to do the work. 
<laughs> the only way well, out is through. Let's do the work, play the song, yeah, and we'll sure. hear what it sounds like. That's good. I hear the goddamn band behind you kind of yeah, as you're doing yeah, that, too. Yeah, they're around somewhere. Well, you were, yeah, when you were talking about it, it's like, okay, now I'm going to embellish in my head. Yeah. That. that sounds great. You know, you've got a song, uh, which I really like, uh, Sick of Words, right? Which, I'll ask you the, the intent, but when I'm listening to it, I think, found it kind of interesting, maybe a bit ironic. The songwriter, singer, does a lot with words. Very verbal. Would be, yeah, very verbal, right. You're not, you're, you've come out of your shell that way. But you're sick of words, or at least in this song you are. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a tongue-in-cheek thing about mm. I am someone who is verbal almost to a fault and processes things very, very, very verbally. Mm -hmm. uh, writes a lot to try to make sense of things and talks a lot to try to make sense of things. And the futility of a life spent spilling all of that language and getting not really ever getting that much closer <laughs> to the understanding, which which is not, that sounds dramatic and almost like something Morrissey would say or something, but it's, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. I think it's kind of funny to have this like attachment to language and words and, 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 and all of these ways you can try to figure out these really like cute and interesting ways to articulate yourself that then you still have the same questions at the end of the day. Right, the, the, the song doesn't solve the problem. No, the song but, is kind of a way of poking fun at the problem a little bit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and 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 maybe, you know, the, you don't. I don't know. Maybe you only solve the problem in in, in bits and bites, like mm -hmm. every day, and right. then the problem kind of you wake up with a new one. You know. But. Another thing I was thinking about that song was just the idea that maybe what works is the music itself, the the instrumentation, not the words. That's sort of another interpretation that maybe that's where you're gaining. Uh, insight from well, it just can the music Well, articulate itself. things that you, you you can't. Right. There's there's right. an expressiveness to it's why you like some people cry when they look at a painting. Right. Or you know hear a certain tone. Uh, you know, uh, instrumental music obviously is can be incredibly moving yeah. and articulate in a way that you and I could sit here and talk all day and mm -hmm. not get at, at the same feeling. You know. So. So that's there's that in there too. Yeah, and there's yeah. shards of kind of guitar glass in that song that mm -hmm. are kind of a way of yeah, <laughs> yeah kind yeah. of getting at the like yeah. ah, yeah. you know That's... frustration of that um switching to the two albums you put out bubblegum and bulldozer that's right uh they were both funded by kickstarter yeah correct yeah and did i mean you raised a lot more money than you expected to i believe yeah tell me tell me the story of how that happened well it took a year for me to get convinced to do it that way mm -hmm. I, I had a lot of perceptional backlash fear Is about there a stigma did you think too? yeah i just yeah. i've i'd seen people do it poorly mm -hmm. i'd also seen people do it and 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 um maybe had it uh people then, the, the audience then look at them and be like, oh, maybe he's in a really bad spot if he needs to come. Although I do think audience perception of the, the music industry is obviously changing super dramatically all the time. And I mm -hmm. think, uh, what, but that, those are my fears that people might look at it and be like, either A, mm -hmm. I see this guy like on f festivals and clubs and sometimes written about places that like famous musicians are written about. <laughs> So how come he needs to do one of those? Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. B, oh, it's things must be tough for Kevin if he needs to come to, come to us for to make his next record. Brother, can you spare it on? Exactly, yeah, alms yeah. for the poor. Yeah. And, and and so it took me a long time to, to to wrap my head around that. What convinced you? I thought that there was a way to do it that was transparent and in keeping with the general spirit of how I've kind of done everything in my career and mm -hmm. communicate directly with the audience about my even my sort of preconceptions about this or mm -hmm. fears about this. And, um, and I just wrote a piece that accompanied the Kickstarter that was very um, plain spoken mm -hmm. about all, of, all mm -hmm. of it. And I also made a commitment that I was going to try to like treat it like uh, seriously and mm -hmm. do, do what was required. Like uh, one thing I didn't want to do is offer these incentives or whatever and have people and then not do things for two years or something. Because people have done that. Right. Where you get all this money and then you don't do the work. Well, that's not good. No, and I thought, <laughs> and that's terrible. And that's kind of like career ending to yeah. my, to my. We'll be like coming back again after that and saying, no, I mean it this yeah, time. Exactly. I, I didn't mean it when I cried wolf the right. first time. So I wanted to be mm. mindful of that and, mm. and, and have a timetable that was firm and, and, and commit to executing it. What really was the clearly. biggest incentive you offered? 
I did a private house show mm -hmm. for somebody, a 60 minute, which turned into a three hour house <laughs> show for somebody. And that was, that was the highest mm -hmm. ticketed thing. But I, I really thought, not only that, but once we put it up, I really thought like, I couldn't look at it. I put, I pressed publish after like the weeks of sort of vetting you go through. <laughs> and I left my apartment for two hours because um, <laughs> I didn't think we were gonna, I thought I was in my world, I was the last person that thought what happened was what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, we had set it for $50,000 to make two records and, and we hit that goal in eight hours. It was a 45 day campaign. I, I thought maybe we'll eke to 50 and which maybe in some people's, you know, music industry terms is modest, but to me, you know, you can make a, you can you, make a record. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. More yeah. than make a record. You can, right. We were trying to make two. Right. And what I did find out was when you're like manufacturing, distributing, paying for all the basically acting as your own record label right um i was really grateful that we ended up making what we made all of it got spent all mm -hmm. of it got used mm -hmm. um and and it enabled me to have like this is kind of the last tour for that project it's now kind of transitioning transitioning into these other projects too mm -hmm. but i was able to do like an 18 month record cycle totally independently on the backs of this thing. Were the records recorded separately or at the same? They, yeah, the Bulldozer was made in March 2013 in LA with a producer named Rob Schnaff. Mm -hmm. Bubblegum was made April 2013 with Jesse from Brand New and the goddamn band. I, what I like is Bubblegum is the harder rocking kind of fuzzed out record, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the Bulldozer yeah. is the softer record. But Bubblegum to me also, <laughs> those songs are like more obvious pop songs in a way. Oh, they're okay. fuzzier and dirtier, but if yeah. you strip them down, like they're real verse, chorus, verse songs. Yeah, yeah. And the Bulldozer stuff's a little... I don't know. Uh -huh. Little, little like uh, there's there's a bit more. There are a few more curveballs on that record. Put you on the spot. What's your favorite bubblegum song of all time? It moves around all the time. As executed on the record, I really love the song Redbird. It's mm -hmm. a really different thing for us. Um, kind of a bit more. Um, I don't know, I, I, the word grunge is an embarrassing word. It was an embarrassing word <laughs> then. then. But it had that has that darkness and kind of yeah. dissonance and um, it's a bit of a different uh, pace and mm -hmm. a bit of a different uh, dynamic is yeah. what I mean to say for us. But if live, it's really fun to play. And there's, also, there's a song I love called Private First Class about Chelsea Manning that, that I, I felt really got something and got the general spirit of that record, so, but it, it moves around, I'm bad at favorites. Let me, let me ask you this, how about historically, in the past, what would be a classic bubblegum record? Oh, I thought, I'm no, sorry. No, no, actually, I, could, I, could have gone either way, and that's a good uh, answer, but. Classic bubblegum record, like, like, bubblegum pop. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, uh, my brain, the radio station in my brain is broken. I think, like, to <laughs> me, like, Teenage Fan Club and Not A Surf, I referenced them already. Yeah. They should be, like, to me, like Taylor Swift and U2 or something, right, the songs right. are so accessible and catchy, but that means the radio station in my head stopped working in like 1991. But um, that bandwagon-esque record by Teenage Fan Club oh, is a great, great one. Yeah, that's a great one. Shame Excellent. About Ray by the Lemonheads is a great one. Yes, I consider those to be bubblegum pop records. And that's in a good way, right? Yeah, yeah it's not a negative in your world. No, right? no, hell no. No, no hell no, you wouldn't yeah. have called an album that. I mean, I feel like that. I'm still trying to write those so those yeah. records now. So yeah. those those people were big influences. Well, I grew up with the, with the Raspberries and the Sweet and bands like yeah. that. Yeah, I had right to kind on. of apologetically tell my friends, yeah, no, no, it's bubblegum. No, apologizing for that, that's, no, that's right on. Um, let's go to a couple of more songs. Sure. You got, What's coming up? What are you I think we're going to do She Can See Me and Speaking of Not a Surf. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're doing a split single series over the course of the next year, and the first one's with Matthew Cause from Not a Surf. So mm -hmm. I'm going to play his song, uh, Inside of Love. Great. So Go for it. All right. It's a beautiful song. Very, uh, Can take no credit for that. Very, I was going to say, uh, very sweet, bittersweet, all kinds of things in there. Uh, yeah, I love that song. Is that a song you wish you'd written? Yeah. Is, I'm figuring that's probably why you chose it, right? Yeah, there's a bunch of songs like that, but that's one of them. He's got a good dozen, the, Matthew. That was I it a hard wrote. hard choice to make? The, no, uh, that's that's one of my favorite songs ever. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I actually remember like exactly where I was when I heard that song. That's wow. one of those moments. How old is the song? 2002, I think that mm -hmm. record came out, mm -hmm. 13 years, yeah. So it's been with you that long? Uh, actually, kind of. I probably heard it in like 2005. Uh -huh. I kind yeah. of, they had a really popular song called Popular, Not A Surf. That was like right. their one kind of top 
40 right, song right. in the mid 90s. And then their career kind of took all these weird looks like divergent <clears throat> paths and, and, and they kind of got lost in the major label shuffle for right, a little while. Right. But then they rebuilt their career as this independent band and they made, have made so much more interesting music since then. And that, that record was, I kind of lost track of them and then I heard that a few years after that record had come mm -hmm. out and fell in love. What, what song did they pick of yours? Today? They did a song of mine from Bubblegum called Fiscal Cliff. Oh yes, kind of yes a, yeah. yeah. Now that's a real rocker on your record, I think. He turned it and into he, this beautiful kind of Sounds yeah. like Peter Paul and Mary or something. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, and do you like I love do, it. do you like it? Yes, I'm probably hearing you do. <laughs> his voice sing the words was like, oh my God. Because I'm a he's become a friend, but I'm a right. fan. So right. hearing hearing him do it was just like a uh, oh pretty God. big thrill for me. That's very cool. Treat. Yeah. Now just tell people a little bit about what this series is, the seven inch thing that you're doing. It's every couple of months. Yeah, so starting this month, every two months for the rest <clears throat> of the year. So, and this is the first volume of it. We'll probably do this on and off throughout my career mm -hmm. but uh it's different partner every two months uh limited run of split like 45 vinyl, seven inch vinyl, single seven inch yep. Yep. and then they'll be available digitally too the two songs mm -hmm. but and um i have this thing where i kind of sit at these weird cross sections of like indie rock punk rock folk singer songwriter emo pop there's all these different yeah and i've never been like brand identified enough to be any one of them it's always been and which has been something that was not necessarily by design it's just the way i write right i think sure. it's made marketing my music hell for the people whose jobs mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. but um but i've met all these different people that are so interesting and make such compelling music from all these different parts of the music mm -hmm. world i thought it'd be cool to do a split ser single series where you reflect that a mm -hmm. bit so, so will the next one be more the first three partners we know, and, and the first mm -hmm. one's Matthew, and Matthew's like, there's also a blend of like people who I listened to, mm -hmm. people who are peers, and people who I think kind of came up listening to my music and mm -hmm. my peers' music. Mm -hmm. So the second one's with, there's this woman, Meredith Graves, she sings in a band called Perfect Pussy. They're a punk rock band from yeah. Brooklyn, and she's really like um, brave, mm -hmm. formidable performer. Like, I, I think her stuff is very cool. and. She's way more in the kind of punk world, and so she's the second partner. And then a Pennsylvania indie rock pop punk band called Tiger's Jaw, mm -hmm. that's really great. And they're, the three of them kind of hold different, they, they're like different points on the map, so to have them be the first three partners is exciting to so me. So will they be doing, and will you be doing acoustic versions too, or these it be rocked up stuff? It depends, each time you know? is different. Yeah. Like the first thing yeah. with Matthew, it's, uh, it's pretty acoustic, we covered each other. Mm -hmm. Meredith and I both wrote new songs. Mm -hmm. And mine is uh, pretty gentle. Hers is pretty, there's a gentility in it, but there's some abrasive instrumental mm -hmm. stuff on hers. Mm -hmm. And I think for Tiger's Draw, we're both going to do full band stuff, but I think we're both going to cover the same artist, Oh. which okay. we haven't announced yet. No, so, no, But yeah, but, cool. uh, but I, and then there's three more partners lined up for the back half of the year. Great, so. that's, that's good. I want to ask you a little bit. We, we, I don't think you've done anything here terrifically political but I know you do political songs yeah G tell me a little bit about where you're coming from that way and how you weave politics into song it's a difficult I guess art, I, I guess there's an aspect of some of the so, I, social justice stuff in parts of now navigate yeah there's some sure, glancing sure. references to like gentrification and, and and what it's like to live in Brooklyn <laughs> sometimes <laughs> but um, and writ large obviously bigger than that yeah. but um, I only really write about social justice issues if I'm moved to do it. I don't feel like it's like a, the responsibility of, of, of the artist or whatever, mm -hmm. although it would be nice to hear more people do it than, than do. And I <laughs> tend to write about them the same way I write about songs that are about relationships or more personal, philosophical, emotional, landscape stuff, which is, um, you know, try to approach it with some empathy, try to approach it um, situationally, and try to write and not sloganeer. Um, but, um, you know, politics aren't super interesting to me, but social justice is. Right. And so, this, you know, the song about Chelsea Manning and the, on the, on Bubblegum and um, that 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 was something that came out of like uh, being moved. 
I understand the political ramifications of that situation, and I have uh, members of my family that wholeheartedly disagree with me about mm -hmm. this, and friends. But mm -hmm. to me, I thought it took a lot of courage to be to say, I don't think this is the direction our country should be going in. I don't think people know what's actually happening on the ground here mm -hmm. in their name with their tax dollars, mm -hmm. and I do. I'm seeing it, mm -hmm. so I'm going to show people at great personal expense. Right. That that moved me. That moved me because I don't think I would do something like that. No. I don't know most. I don't know many people that would. <laughs> right. And, right. Uh, and I thought those are the kinds of things that that I think you know deserve to get written about and did, written about with humanity. Did you listen to Billy Bragg at all? I like Billy Bragg. I was going to say yeah, you yeah. remind me here of Billy. Uh, not in voice, <laughs> very well, different voice. I, I, but. I, I, I think he's, I like him a lot. Yeah. Righteous, smart, committed dude. Yes, he but, is. Yeah. He is. He's been, uh, he's funny sometimes because he, uh, he gets on, sometimes if you've seen him live, he, he'll get on a political platform, which, which is just his nature, you can't help it. Yeah. And there are people in the audience who will yell, Billy, we're with you, we get it. Play a song. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so. and I've had people, I've put out probably 130 songs over these eight records and Bad Books records and my old band Miracle of 86. And But it's probably 10 or 12 of them that explicitly yeah. deal with issues of social justice. Sure. But I, there are people who don't like me at all because I do that. Really? So yeah, you yeah, can, well, and that's, that's fine. They'll be able to find an, uh, plenty of other musicians who don't. Yeah, so that's, that's fine. exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, well, we've got one more song to go. It's kind of a countryish song, isn't it? Yeah, a matter of time. I, I, it's it is. It's, uh, I like you know. I I also like Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, and um, you know I grew up with some of that stuff too, and grew into some of that stuff mm -hmm. too. So. Um, and it's kind of a love song. I, I, I don't, I didn't, I don't write many straight ones. And so when they happen, I try to just like get out of the way. <laughs> I can go but, for it. Yeah. Well, let me uh, just say goodbye and then we'll send it so off with, with the song. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, yeah. My name is Jim Sullivan. I've been your host here today for Boston Rock Talk with Kevin Devine, who is going to now play us out uh, here at the Sinclair uh, with A Matter of Time. Thank you. Thank you.